Hi, I'm James Vowles. I'm the Motorsport Strategy Director for the team. It's an absolute pleasure to be back racing. Uh, we've all missed this terribly. It's our passion, it's our life. And I'm glad that we got to experience it, have our first race under our belt, and we're really looking forward to getting the season properly underway now. Most of the questions we have are around the gearbox issues that clearly we experienced during the race. These issues were actually first seen in Free Practice 1 and in Free Practice 2. But the problems weren't an unknown going into the race. What we didn't know is how well we were able to get on top of the issues before we really used the car in anger. The reality behind it is that the Austrian circuit is very, very aggressive, especially with the curbs. It puts a lot of load into suspension members and into the car. You have to use the curbs in order to get the lap time out of it. But those curbs are also generating a lot of vibrations in the car and a lot of load in the car. The issue itself in the gearbox is electrical by nature. And the reality behind it is that we now have a few days to get on top of this issue. We have a number of people back at the factory working day and night for this. In fact, they were working in parallel to the Grand Prix. Whilst the Grand Prix was taking place, they were already doing their utmost to try and understand what the problems were to get ahead of the issue before we get into this week. We know that if we don't get on top of these issues, it will be a problem again in just a few days' time. And the reality behind it is that it's a problem that could have cost one or both cars the opportunity to finish the race on Sunday. Equally, it's a complex problem. If it was something straightforward, we would have done our best to fix it last week, and clearly we didn't. All we know right now is there are electrical elements of the gearboxes that are suffering, and we need to do more in order to get them through a Grand Prix. Dovetailing onto that first question is really the second question about Austria and its curbs. As I mentioned, you have to run wide on these curbs here. You have to use all of the curbs available to you in order to get the lap time out of it. That's why, in fact, shortcut loops at turn nine and turn 10 that detect when you've really pushed the boundaries too far and your lap can be taken away from you by the FIA. Those curbs are serrated in nature and they're reasonably tall, but when you run them at speeds of over 200 kilometers an hour, in fact, it puts this oscillation, this load into the car and a number of areas have failed. You've seen in the past, suspension members have failed here, front wings have failed, and indeed this weekend, again, with our competitors, you saw something similar. The attrition rate during the race was enormous. Most teams lost one car. And again, that's a fundamental of both being really the first race of the season, but also the fact that this Austrian circuit is very aggressive on the cars and shakes it to bits. We knew that that was going to be a problem before going even into the race weekend. And you deal with it a number of different ways. You have perhaps more spares here than you would do normally. You're also talking to the drivers continuously about what curbs they can use and what curbs they can't. Clearly, when you're in a qualifying condition, you really need to try and maximize the lap time. So you try and use everything. But in the race, it's different. You simply can't abuse the car for that many laps without problems occurring. And what we could see during the race was a problem building and it was important to avoid using those curbs. We spoke to the drivers before the race. We gave them a briefing on what was expected and where to go to. But in reality, the problems were perhaps worse than we had anticipated, and we had to react even more aggressively during the course of the race. By avoiding the curbs, it's not free. Clearly, you're going to lose lap time as the result. To give you an idea, it's a couple of tenths around here. Now, that's something that we can afford to do for a few laps, but not necessarily all race. And that's part of the problem. The problem is that both drivers were pushing each other and pushing for the win of the race. And the reality behind that is that there is a compromise in the balance between using the curbs and gaining the lap time or keeping the car in one piece to the end. There were a number of safety cars during the course of the race, but probably the most decisive in terms of what the podium looked like was with the George Russell stopping on track towards the end of the race. We don't react to safety cars as they're deployed. We talk about what would happen in a few laps time. So several laps earlier, we would have gone through exactly this scenario. We had tires ready. We had the soft under the pod, should we wish to stop. And we just had time to react, just. Valtteri was at the pit entry line when the safety car was called. Lewis would have had around about a second and a half, two seconds to react. So it was incredibly close on the road, but we would have been able to get both cars in and stack them at the pit stop. But therein was the problem. When we stack them, Lewis would have lost a lot of race time and he would have dropped behind several cars behind us in the train, Perez and Albon. Now you're not sure what they're gonna do. They may stay out, they may stop. It depends on how they're feeling on their tires and what their models say. What we knew was there would be some element of risk 
putting one of our cars behind another one on the road. We can't use the curbs. We're in a very fragile state. And overtaking those cars and asking Lewis to overtake those cars could have actually put him out the race as a result. And that was the balance of decision making that we were taking on the pit wall. We knew that that soft tyre would be very quick, but equally, we expected that that hard tyre, once it was just up to temperature, would be good enough to hold on the assault if anyone behind took it. More so, two cars often is a better protection than just one by itself out front. So on the balance of all of the information that we had available to us, we concluded that we would just be okay if we stayed out, but it wouldn't be comfortable. The reality behind it is that Alpine was incredibly fast on those opening laps on the soft tyre. And the reality is we'll go through every decision that we made, this one included, and review what we should have done in hindsight. But more importantly, what we have to tune within our models and our thought process to not make these mistakes again. Lewis and Albon came together towards the dying throes of the race, and Lewis received a five-second penalty as the result of that. We knew that it'd be unlikely that we would pull Leclerc out of the window, but we very much believed it was possible to keep Lewis on the podium. We instructed both Lewis and Valtteri to do fast laps towards the end, but there was a double yellow that appeared. Valtteri did what it was correct to do and slowed down sufficiently for that double yellow. That slow lap was slightly more than others behind and just lost a lot of the gap that we had available to us. From that point onwards, on those used hard tyres, both Valtteri and Lewis did their utmost, but we missed out on that podium position by a few tenths. In hindsight, better communication between the two may well have just got us those few missing tenths, but it would have been close. We talked about inverting our cars on track and putting Lewis ahead of Valtteri, but often that can lead to more complications than it's worth and more loss of time than it's worth when one is unsure of where to let the other one through, and we opted against it. We've had a question in about how the color of the paint on the car affects other systems, for example, temperature. And the reality is it doesn't. Inside the engine cover, there's actually a silver lining, a, a heat resistant lining. And that is in place irrespective of the outside color. But we can't see any difference on our radiator temperatures or other temperatures of core systems within the car as the result of the paint color externally. There's a little bit more reflection that should exist really with a lighter color. But the reality is it has negligible effects or no effects on our system temperatures. We've had a question come in over whether or not we have a wealth of data from last week and does that make anything easier as we go into this race weekend at the same venue? The answer is yes. You always get better answers than trying to interpolate across an entire year worth of data, which is what we were doing prior to coming here. So we're combining a little bit of winter testing with what we learned from Austria in 2019. The reality is, is we have current information on this car be it from a perspective of load over the curbs, problems that we're experiencing, but possibly more importantly for this question, how the tyres performed under the conditions we had. The only proviso I would put in here is that it's very unlikely we'll get exactly the same conditions on Sunday that we had last weekend. In fact, as I stand here right now, there's rain on the horizon towards next weekend, and the conditions could be entirely different. So while some of it is carryover, all you need is a 5 or 10 degree temperature change before really you're relearning a lot of the foundations that you had to start with. For the drivers, yes, they've experienced now really a qualifying and a race in this environment, and they will be able to really improve on that and optimize on that further. Again, from a car setup perspective, we know what worked and what didn't work last week, and we can experiment further again, as will all teams. What it means is that everyone should be able to refine their package just slightly more and eke out just a few more milliseconds of performance. Clearly, between the last Grand Prix and what we're going to experience this weekend, we're not going to necessarily bring new components to the car or modify the car in some drastic manner. So you're going to work with a very similar package to what you had previously. What we're going to do now is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are all days that we can use to really build on the understanding that we had from this Grand Prix. Look through the data and pour through some of the details that we had Specifically in our case, clearly we need to be looking at reliability and understanding what we can do to be better next weekend. And that's what we'll spend every hour of the day doing that we have available to us. You would have seen that the DAS went through a bit of a hard time this weekend. It was questioned on its legality, but fortunately we were able to race it. This is a fantastic achievement for everyone that's been working on this project for many, many months. It worked as we would hoped it would work. 
In other words, the drivers use that during the course of the race weekend. They used it in the race. They used it in qualifying. They used it in free practice. The reality behind it, though, is you don't fully understand the potential of a system until you've operated it at multiple circuits. So we have an understanding of how it benefited us here, but not necessarily how we can use it going forward at all events in order to get the most out of it. That learning will come, especially as we transition to other circuits and see how it performs elsewhere. But thus far, we're very happy with how it's performed. Thank you very much for all of your questions. It really, really means a lot to us to be back here racing. It's a passion we share with you, and I'm glad to see that really come through in all the questions that come to us. Please keep those going. We'll be here to answer your questions after the next Austrian Grand Prix in just a few days' time, so please send those in.